morning from Psalm 148, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded, and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Mr. Joseph Wagner will introduce our opening hymn. Our first hymn, number 164, Angels from the Realms of Glory, number 164. And we'll stand and sing.
Jesus Christ, who at thy first coming did send thy messenger to prepare the way before thee, grant that the ministers and stewards of thy mysteries may likewise so prepare and make ready the way, by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, that at the second coming to judge the world we may be found an acceptable people in thy sight, who lives and reigneth with the Father and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. The epistle for this morning is found in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 to 5, and that's on page 1130 of the Pew Bible. So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear. But that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore judge nothing before the Lord. I'm sorry. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. The Gospel for this morning is found in Matthew 11, verses 2 to 10, and that is on page 965. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you, what did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's play, palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Please join me in reading the Lord's our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
question. We are looking at question number 192, which reads as follows. What is a sacrament? The answer of a larger catechism is a sacrament is an holy ordinance instituted by Christ in his church to signify, seal, and exhibit unto those that are within the covenant of grace the benefits of his mediation to strengthen and increase their faith and all other graces, to oblige them to obedience, to testify and cherish their love and communion one with another, and to distinguish them from those that are without. The sacrament is a very special ordinance within the life of the church. It's set apart by Christ himself for our growth in grace. Uh, we have two sacraments given to us. One that initiates our entrance into the kingdom of God, or recognizes that entrance in our baptism. The other recognizes our continuance within the covenant of grace, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. They're both instituted by Christ, given by Him to uh, strengthen us. Of course, uh, Jesus at the very beginning of His ministry preached a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And He and His disciples baptized many, although I think John notes that uh, Jesus Himself did not baptize personally, but the disciples did on his behalf. Uh, the communion service was set apart by Christ the, in the Last Supper as he met with his disciples before his crucifixion. He gave that communion meal uh, and uh, uh, encouraged them to remember his death as they ate this communion meal. So these sacraments are holy ordinances instituted by Christ within the life of His church. And their design is for the benefit of the church and not for mankind in general. They are unique to the church. Their purpose is to signify, seal, and exhibit uh, uh, the benefits of Christ's mediation. Signify, that is to instruct us, to teach us, to show us. They uh, are uh, a, the Word of God in visible form, designed to educate us as to what Christ has done for us in His cross. Uh, some think that we need uh, pictures uh, in the church buildings or either or, or in Bibles or in, in all kinds of places to educate those who are illiterate. Well, Christ gives us these pictures to signify, to place before us His work of redemption on our behalf. Those are the pictures that Christ gives to us which we should pay close attention to. Uh, the benefits of Christ are sealed to us within the sacrament. That is to say, it is secured for us in that sacrament. We are assured of our relationship with Christ in view of our participation in that sacrament. So all of the benefits of Christ's redemption on our behalf are in some way have that kind of seal of God's approval or that seal of uh, God's authorization that they belong to us. And finally, they exhibit uh, the benefits of Christ's mediation. They are uh, pictures uh, of Christ's work. And so these are given to those who are within the covenant of grace. Those who have been enlightened by the Spirit and have received the benefits of Christ's mediation through faith, these are the ones for whom these sacraments are to be given. When individuals come into the church, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are not open to anyone to take part in. They must give some evidence of Christian faith, either they or their children in the case of uh, infant baptism parents on behalf of their children. The uh, sacrament is given for those within the covenant of grace and not just for all men. So uh, we require an examination for uh, the right participation in these sacraments. They are intended to strengthen and increase the faith of those who take part in them. They teach us, they instruct us, they encourage us, they seal our faith, and so they, are, they increase our faith. 
and all other graces, our love for each other, our hope in God's provision for us in Christ, so the sacraments uh, do that. They oblige us to obedience. We are reminded of that, especially in the Lord's Supper, that's perhaps where we come most in, into uh, view of our obedience before the Lord. We should walk with Him. The meal is designed to strengthen us for our journey to the heavenly city. But even baptism also tells us that we should live a new life, that we are raised from the dead, that we are enlivened by the Spirit of God to live before God. And so both sacraments oblige us to obedience. They testify to our love within the life of the church. We are one body joined to one another in Christ. And we are distinguished by these sacraments from those that are without. You may recall that in our studies of the book of Revelation, there was a seal placed on the people of God, separating them from the judgments that were to come on the world. God seals His people. He seals us with His Holy Spirit. He seals us with these sacraments. He secures us for His eternal inheritance. We are secure in Christ. And these sacraments are part of that which... God uses to set us apart for Himself from the rest of the world. Do you participate in the sacraments? Has the sign of the covenant in baptism been applied to you such that you are named by Christ? Do you take part regularly in the communion meal so that you can be strengthened by grace? These are the marks of those who are among the people of God. May God work in each heart that we might take part in these sacraments. Next hymn number 119, O Lord, how shall I meet thee? Number 119, we'll stand. And sing.
beginning with verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything He might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all His fullness dwell in Him, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through His blood shed on the cross. Let's pray. Father, as we look to Your Word this morning, we pray that Your Spirit would show us our Savior, Jesus Christ, Show us His glory, His majesty, and dominion. Show us His great mercies and grace. We pray that through this uh, meditation on Christ and His glory, Your Spirit would strengthen us for worship, for obedience, for service in the world today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1950, a movie uh, came out starring Jimmy Stewart, uh, in, which was called... Harvey. Maybe some of you remember that movie, but it's the story of a gentleman by the name of Elwood Dowd who had a mysterious friend. It was an invisible puka rabbit, six foot, three and a half inches tall, in fact. And everywhere Elwood went, he introduced friends to uh, Harvey, this invisible rabbit. Uh, many people thought that Elwood was slightly deranged. Uh, he was an admitted drunk, and quite often you find him appearing in the local bar. Oddly enough, that the uh, patrons there at the bar uh, welcomed both Elwood and his invisible friend, and even talked to Harvey. Uh, but outside the bar, of course, folks didn't have the same quite easy spirit. Uh, they thought that Elwood was slightly uh, deranged, a little bit insane. In fact, at one point, his sister uh, attempted to have him brought into a mental institution. At one point, when they were going to inject him with serum, I forget the number, 911, not quite that, but close to that, uh, the thought was that that would rid him of this imaginary, invisible friend. But the sister finally came around and said, no, don't do that because he's such a wonderful guy just as he is. What was going on in that movie? I'm rather curious, and I don't quite know the answer to that. In my skeptical mindset, in my theological grid, I look at that movie as something of a, a criticism of evangelical Christians who believe in an invisible God who is with them everywhere they go. Uh, who is welcomed by others who are similarly intoxicated with this view of God. But outside in the scientific realm, in the realm of uh, fact and theory, the, that kind of notion of this invisible puka rabbit is insane, worthy of being institutionalized. And in the 1950s, you recall that that is at the time of the Soviet Union and its heyday, and we know of stories of uh, those Christians within the Soviet Union who were considered mentally deranged because of their beliefs in God, and many were placed in insane asylums to be treated for their beliefs. More recently, you find uh, atheists who continue to hold to the idea that belief in the supernatural is something of a mental derangement, something of an insanity. Do you believe in an invisible God? Is He with you in all of life? Has He transformed your life and made you pleasant? Communists say that religion was the opiate of the masses. It made them more pliable, more gullible. 
Uh, Bertrand Russell, an atheist philosopher, uh, used a different image rather than a puka rabbit. <laughs> he talked about an invisible China teapot that circulated around the earth, out in the atmosphere, way above, where nobody could possibly see this little China teapot. And Bertrand Russell would say, you know, it's incumbent upon those who assert that there is a China teapot out there to prove it, rather than for me, the scientific uh, individual, to say, well, it doesn't exist. You've got to show that it's really there. And with that, he tried to say that Christians need to show that God is really present in the world. Well, I wonder at that. I think the problem with the modern atheist and the scientific uh, means that he would reduce all of thought and life to is that he is using one form of investigation which by definition rules out the supernatural. By definition, rules out that which is invisible. Uh, it's like casting a net into the sea with big holes within it and trying to catch minnows. They slip right through the grid. The scientific method of experimentation with visible physical things will never detect an invisible God. And this, therefore rule it out as impossible is simply uh, naive. Foolish. God's invisibility should no more be a mark against his existence than the invisibility of electricity. I can't see electricity. I can't see radio waves. I can't see the air around me right now. But I would know if they were gone, if they were missing, if there was no oxygen in the air, I'd know that it was missing. Invisibility does not mean non-existence. But happily, God in His providence, in His mercies to us, in the way that He accommodates Himself to us, reveals Himself in wonderful ways, most especially through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's something of the point that Paul wants to make now in his letter to the church at Colossae. He's been talking about this great work of God whereby He takes us or transfers us from the dominion of darkness, that dark realm that's limited by its own ideas about life in general. God takes us from that and transfers us into the kingdom of His own dear Son. A kingdom of light, where we have an inheritance laid up for us, where we have the forgiveness of sins, where we have redemption purchased for us by God's Son. We live in this new kingdom of light. And it's a kingdom that is ruled and dominated by God's Son. Well, if Paul acquaints us with Jesus the Son, who rules over the kingdom of light, maybe we should know something about His being, His uh, personhood. Is He up for the job, if you will? Is He capable of ruling the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God? Is he sufficient for this task of producing the forgiveness of sins and redemption, full and complete, of providing us an inheritance with God? Is Jesus capable of doing all of this? Well, that's where Paul leads us in this next section, verses 15 through 20, which uh, some commentators look at and consider that it's a, an ancient hymn that perhaps Paul made use of in uh, writing this book, uh, he borrows from the hymn and inserts it here in this place to teach us about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all of creation. You'll notice that the way that the, the text is laid out for us is it, very structured. It's an orderly arrangement. You have the introdu introduction of this son, the image of the invisible God, and then it talks about him being the firstborn of creation. Then the firstborn, if you will, of the dead or of the church. So there's a parallel structure between Christ as the head over all of creation and then Christ as the head over his church. And you go through these two uh, parallel categories, if you will, and you see that the, the development is similar. Firstborn, the one who rules over all, the one for whom all things are designed. Christ rules over all. He is 
supreme over all. He is preeminent over all things. I like that phrase, the preeminence of Christ. It reminds me of my uh, college uh, motto, in all things, Christ preeminent. It was what uh, Covenant College, now uh, Lookout Mountain, Georgia, uh, used to teach all of us students that all of life, all of our academic disciplines were to be brought under Jesus Christ. In all academic disciplines, Christ is supreme and Lord of all, and we should bring each discipline under His dominion and see all of life as under His control. And that uh, emphasis, uh, which I also learned at Philmont Christian Academy, is an emphasis that I've carried with me ever since. Christ is preeminent, supreme over all. There is no area of life of which Jesus is absent, of which Jesus has nothing to do with. Every area of life is under His Lordship and dominion. And that's what Paul would bring to our attention here. This Son, Jesus, who is over the kingdom of light, is one who is preeminent or supreme over all, and rightly so. And he gives us a description of who this Jesus is. Uh, first, let's talk about his description of Jesus as the image of the invisible God. Uh, that, with the, the next uh, phrase speaking of him being the firstborn of creation, clearly brings us back into the, the realm of uh, the creation account. Adam and Eve being made in the image of God there in creation. Adam and Eve being placed as the head of humanity over the earth, having dominion over all the creatures, uh, subduing them before the Lord God Himself. Christ is the one who is this image of God par excellence. In fact, when you listen to what Paul has to say here, it's clear, obvious, I think, that when he describes Jesus as the image of the invisible God, he's not merely going back to Adam and Eve and saying, like Adam and Eve, Jesus is made in the image of God. Because after all, we too are made in the image of God, though that image has been defaced by our sin and corrupted, we're still made in God's image. And so when Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, what is he really saying that is not true of each of us in some form or fashion? I can imagine the modernists coming to this text would say, there you are. <laughs> He's just a man like you and I. Paul meant to say nothing more than that. But I ask you, if that's really what he intended, that Jesus being the image of the invisible God was just man, like you and I, how does he distinguish him? How does that description distinguish him from all of creation and all of the church who is underneath him? It's like me trying to describe for you this beautiful automobile that I saw just the other day. And you ask me, what is about it that I liked? Describe it for me. And I say, well, it had four tires. What? <laughs> Can you tell me more? There's nothing about that description that says anything about what I saw. Really, all cars have four tires to them. What have you said? Nothing. <clears throat> Similarly here, when Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, he's not simply saying that Jesus is like us, made in God's image. It's something different. In a different realm. In a different... Capacity. Jesus is qualitatively God, the one who reveals the Father to us. Now, this is consistent with what we find elsewhere in the Scriptures. Uh, later in this very letter, Paul will describe Jesus as the one in whom the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid. Uh, it's in Christ that God's fullness is uh, found. All the fullness of God resides in Christ. But you might think uh, of several other places, the writer to the Hebrews and the way that he opens his book. He speaks of Jesus as being the radiance of the Father's glory, the exact representation of his image. 
Jesus is the one who reveals the Father to us. And mind you, he does that in the context of opening of the book, saying that in the previous days, uh, in many forms and fashions, God revealed himself through the fathers and the prophets in many ways. But in these last days, he's revealed himself through his Son. And it's this revelation through the Son that is of a higher order, if you will, than that which is through the prophets of old. This one is God's own very Son, unique, set apart from all of humanity. He is God who enters into this world to reveal the Father to us. The Apostle John puts it in a different way in the opening of his Gospel, chapter 1. He describes Jesus as the Word of God, who was with God at the beginning, and was God. Here, this idea of revelation, of picturing, of explanation, is placed in the forefront. Jesus is this Logos, this Word of God, who reveals God to us. And John goes on later in that first chapter to talk about how this Word became flesh, and He's the one who has explained God to us, or exegeted God to us. And throughout the Gospel, you'll see Jesus explaining God to us. You might think of Jesus in Matthew 11, praying for the Father, and speaking of how uh, He knows the Father, and the Father knows Him, and Jesus reveals the Father to all that the Father has given to Him. You see, there is this role that Jesus has that is unique. He is the Son of God who reveals the Father to us in a way which is unique and special. Those of you who are fathers understand something of that, in that you look at your sons or your daughters and say, they share my likeness. They look something like me. They act something like me. I can see myself in them. And if somebody looks at them, they can see something of me in them. Jesus is unique in that way. As the Son of the Father. He shows us the Father in unique and special ways. He reveals Him to us. But if there are questions about Jesus being the eternal pre-existent Son of God who entered into this world to reveal the Father to us, then the remainder of what Paul has to say about Him should remove any uh, doubt in that respect. He talks about Him being the firstborn from the firstborn of creation. And at first blush, that might suggest that Jesus was the first creature made by God. The firstborn gives us the idea of a family where a child suddenly comes into the life of the family. Is Jesus nothing more than that? The first creation of God, uh, through whom then God made other things. That is the understanding that... Uh, disseminated among the early church under a heresy called Arianism, under a, a, a bishop by the name of Arius, who argued that Jesus was the first creature of God, or an angel of God, but was not God himself. Not pre-existent. Not pre-existent God. And so he denied the Trinity. But this uh, phrase, the firstborn of creation, does not in any way suggests that he's the first one that was created. This idea of firstborn not only has the idea of the first in time or chronology, but also first in rank or position. And that's the idea that Paul is bringing before us here. Jesus occupies a special rank or position over all of creation. That's like the firstborn child would have in the ancient Jewish families he would receive a double portion of the inheritance, thereby being responsible for the care of his parents and uh, have certain rights and privileges that were accorded to him. Similarly, Christ is the firstborn in his father's house. He holds a rank or a position over all of creation. And that's the, the idea that Paul makes use of here. It's borrowed perhaps as well from Psalm 89 verse 27 where God says of David that he would be the firstborn among the kings of the earth. David was not the first king in the world. But he would occupy this exalted position. 
because of uh, God's great work in his life. You occupy a, a rank of priority. And so this is what Paul is telling us, that Jesus is prior to creation, and if that is not clear, then the remainder of the text should make that abundantly clear, in that uh, through him all things were made, whether they were things in heaven or on earth, things visible or invisible. All things were created by Jesus Christ. Now Paul uses universal language here. All things were created by Christ, invisible and visible, earthly and heavenly. Christ created them all. The ability to create is not something that creatures have. We cannot create out of nothing, as Jesus did. Only God can create in that capacity. But what is more, because all things were created by Him, He is accepted. He is not created. He always was. He is the eternal Son of God. This one takes on our humanity in Jesus and is entrusted as the firstborn over all of creation, over the angelic powers and all their influence in the world today, over earthly powers, however you might describe them. Jesus Christ is the Son of God and rules over all of creation. And Paul even makes this point more dramatically in that all things are created through Him, or in Him, and for Him. They have as their goal being to His glory, glory and praise. So Paul tells us of this Jesus who is exalted in this way. I think what I will do is say the second part of the uh, work of Christ as the head of the ch church for next time. But I'll make this point with where we're at at the moment. As Paul has shown us Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all of creation, in other words, eternal God, we should have a, a fresh view of Jesus in His glory and His majesty, and not diminish that glory in any way by suggesting that He was a mere man, or even further suggesting that we don't even know whether he lived in history and time. We're questioning whether we can discover the historical Jesus. That's what many in the modern church do today. Through their use of historical uh, methodologies, uh, applying that to the Gospels and so forth, they dismiss what the Gospels have to say. It's like saying, I will hear nothing, see nothing, uh, pay no attention to the truth, I'll put that aside, and then I'll explore what the rest of the world has to say about Jesus. And if I find something there about Jesus, then I'll say that, well, he's true. That's basically what they do. The gospel accounts of Jesus are mostly stripped away. And very little remains except that which appeals to the modern mind about Jesus of history. And then they can figure this Christ of faith who really is not necessarily related to this Jesus of history, and in Paul Tillich's terms, may be separated from this Christ. In fact, for Tillich, it's not necessary that we have Jesus of history. We just have the Christ of faith. We have this new being introduced to humanity. I don't want to get it too far into that. But the point is this. We diminish our view of Christ when we dismiss His divine nature and simply describe him on human terms. We miss the full glory of what Paul has to say here, of this one who is for us. He is the Lord of creation. And we need to hear that today. Today, in a day when there's so much chaos in the world. Today, when a gunman can walk into an elementary school and begin shooting, destroying 20 little children. When this is not the only time where this kind of thing has occurred. When there are all kinds of massacres going on all around the world. 
when children are being slaughtered in abortion clinics, and nothing much is said about that among many, when there is so much evil in the world today, we need to be reminded that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation, and He rules over all, accomplishing His own purposes for His own ends, to His own glory and praise. His judgments are evident in the earth. His great salvation also is evident as well. And the church needs to look in faith to Jesus, the Lord of all, and allow His dominion over all to carry them through the darkness of our world today. He is the one who alone has the answers, who can explain God and His ways to us. And if we wish to understand God, then we must do it through Jesus. Because He is the one who alone is capable of revealing the Father to us. It's, as though it's the same as what Jesus said to His disciples, Philip and Thomas. If you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through Him. If you wish to understand the world, if you wish to understand what's going on, you must see it through Jesus Christ, through the revelation that He gives to us of God and Scripture. <clears throat> and hear what He has to say. For He is the image of the invisible God. Do you have an invisible friend? One who goes with you in all of life, who makes you pleasant among others. Jesus is no puka rabbit. Jesus is the Lord of creation. And he has dominion over all. And those who doubt and dismiss him will find that one day they will meet him face to face. And they will be cast out of his presence for an eternity. They will live in a universe without a visible God, much to their dismay. This one will reveal the wrath of God on the wicked. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Let's trust in the revelation that's given to us of this God and follow that revelation and not ideas of men. Father, we thank you for your word, the word who is from God, who is with God. We thank you that he's revealed the Father to us. We pray that your spirit would take the message of Christ, of the glory of the Father that is evident in him. We pray, O oh Lord, that he would reveal the Father to many, even today, those who are in the darkness of sin and enslaved to that darkness will be set free by the light and the glory and the radiancy of Christ's image of the Father. We ask for your blessing on your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's word with our morning offerings. And today we will have a duet with Catherine and Rebecca Wagner. <coughs> Stand and sing praise to God for all of his blessings to us. Let's stand and sing his praise.
for us as a faithful father, care for our earthly needs, provide for our spiritual needs as well through faith in Christ. We pray for your blessing on us as we give ourselves and these offerings to you. We pray that you would use them to glorify in the name of Christ in all the earth. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. Let's turn to the Lord at this time and confess to Him all your sins. Father, we thank you for your word and how your word searches on our hearts and examines our hearts and minds and shows us our sin, or our imperfections, our failures to live in accord with the loving requirements that you give in your word. We would humble ourselves before you and repent of our sins. We pray that you would forgive us for each one, for each sin against you and against our neighbor. We pray that you would wash them all away. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would cleanse us from these things, that we might be more faithful, more loving, more uh, perfect, following after Christ our Lord, that his glory, that his image, would be more faithfully reflected in us, that Christ would be exalted through us. So we ask for the forgiveness of our sins and renewed grace and strength through your Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord promises to forgive His church in these words from the prophet Micah, chapter 7. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of His inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. Thanks be to God for His great mercies to us. Let's turn to our gracious God and present to Him our request and seek His help for our uh, needs. Let's pray. Father, we would humble ourselves before You and acknowledge that any good thing that we've received has come from You. It's not the result of our hard work or our intelligence or uh, our discipline, but it's merely by Your grace. It's by your grace that we even work hard. It's by your grace that we have diligence. It's by your grace that we do all things. So we thank you for your mercies to us. We thank you for your provision for our earthly needs. Thank you for sustaining many of us through life, through many years of life in this world. We thank you for protecting us from harm and from evil, for preserving our hearts through faith, for keeping us secure for this great and glorious inheritance that is laid up for us in Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to minister to our needs and watch over us in this evil and dark world. We pray that you would grant us grace that we might shine as lights in this dark place, that Christ's glory would be manifested in us. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would build your church here in this place, that First Presbyterian Church would be a bright, and glorious light within this community, a spiritual light that enlightens many uh, to the truth that is in Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord, that your spirit would bless and prosper your work here, that many would uh, follow Jesus and serve him uh, through the work of this ministry here. So we ask for your blessing on each of us, not only the preaching of your word from Sunday to Sunday, but the way that we live our lives from day to day in the workplace, in our families, in our community, in neighborhoods. We pray, Lord, that our, our life and our testimony will be blessed by you, and that many of those around us would see that there is something different about us, that we are sons of light and the sons of day, and that their dark eyes would be opened by your spirit, that they might see and grab hold of us and come into your kingdom. Bless your church, O oh Lord. Bless our Sunday school teachers. We thank you for their diligence in attending to the uh, growth and maturity and uh, uh, knowledge of our children. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on each one. We pray for our, our children. We thank you for them. We pray that you would watch over and protect them and disciple them in Christ's name. We pray, O oh Lord, that your, your spirit would be at work in their hearts. Preserve them from sin and from evil. We pray, O oh Lord, that they would walk with you by your Spirit. Father, we pray for our elderly. We pray that you would minister to their earthly needs. We pray that you would sustain them in life, deliver them from trouble and hardship. 
Lord, we just pray that you would protect each one, provide for their needs. Uh, we pray for uh, uh, each one. We just pray, Lord, that you would watch over them. Bless our uh, those of us who are younger and healthy and working in, in our community and in our homes and our uh, places of business. We pray that you would uh, prosper us in our efforts. And we pray that you would uh, provide for our families and our loved ones and for our country as well. Lord, we pray for our country that you would turn us from sin, from darkness, from evil, and bring us into the light of your kingdom. We pray that the tragedies and the sorrows and the pains of this past week would remind the people of this world not only of the shortness of life, but also the evil of this world and how necessary it is that we flee the evil, that we repent, we repent of sin and trust in Christ alone. And so, Lord, we pray for the outpouring of your spirit and the preaching of your word from week to week. Build your church and save our country. Deliver us from our evil. Father, we pray the same for other nations of the earth as well. We pray that you would rescue many from their sins and build Christ's kingdom in each, each nation. We pray for your blessing on those who serve. Father, we thank you for your mercies to us. We pray that you would be, be with us as we uh, continue to serve this day. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. In our final hymn, we will sing, As with gladness, men love gold. Joseph White will lead us in that hymn. Before, as with gladness, men of all, I will stand. 